Today, we'll see how this season's Cinderella teams earn conference titles. The Bengals were the winners of a chilling championship in Cincinnati. It was warmer in San Francisco, and the action was hot, too, as the 49ers reached for the moon and pulled down the NFC crowd. We'll also look back at the great performances of 1981 and preview Super Bowl 16 with special guest Allie Sherman. This is Pro Football Yesterday and Today. This is NFL Review and Preview. Hi, I'm Steve Sable of NFL Films. And filling in for Harry Callis this week as our guest host is the former Coach of the Year for the New York Giants, Allie Sherman. Allie, what about some early thoughts on Super Bowl 16? This, this Super Bowl has a couple of distinctive features, I, I believe, Steve. Number one, the, the, there are no big names. If you had a Dallas, you'd have four or five blockbuster kind of guys who have played All-Pro or, or Oakland, Pittsburgh, right. Philadelphia. These two teams are two well-put-together ball clubs. Uh, they've played consistently. They've got great records. I think uh, you will find, I, I believe this, this is one game where the coaching differences may be one of the big factors. Maybe the coaches are the stars of the Super Bowl this year. It could be. The, uh, most people like to say it's the ball players, except the coaches. They don't like to say that. <laughs> they, but uh, this could well be. How, how a coach handles his ball club in, these, in the two weeks previous, neither club has undergone that, where they had a time gap of two weeks. They've, they've normally had a one-week rhythm in getting ready for a ball game. Now they're going to the big one. And um, each coach will have a different way of approaching it. One thing, experience won't be a factor in the Super Bowl, Alley, because this is the first time since Super Bowl III that both teams will be appearing in the Super Bowl for the first time. So that negates the old thing about the team that's been to the Super Bowl before has an advantage. That's right. That's right. And, and, and the way they practice now, normally if you have a team like Dallas in it that's been there a number of times and maybe a first-time ball club, that, that man playing on the first-time ball club while he's practicing has got to feel a buildup of pressure. Wondering, mm -hmm. well, gee, this is Dallas, see? Mm -hmm. But they're not going to feel that about each other. So you, I think, I think there's going to be a, a Super Bowl where... Once the first kickoff goes, both teams are going to play with more abandon than we've seen in other, oh, other Super Bowls. Great. All right, Allie and I will be right back with more on NFL Review and Preview. The Chargers played the Bengals on a day destined to be frozen in the NFL history. It was an afternoon that made the winter at Valley Forge look more like a Club Med vacation, Allie. But one thing that impressed me when I was watching the game was that the weather seemed to affect the Chargers' passing attack more than the Bengals. Why do you think that was so? Well, I, I, I think, I, I believe it was this. I think it's a choice of the pass plays that Fouts was using as compared to what Anderson was doing with Cincinnati, Steve. Uh, Fouts uh, and, and the San Diego pass offense, which I have a high regard for, and I'm not alone in that. It's a great one. They were still throwing the same kind of balls they throw on a normal day in California or wherever. No wind. He was throwing to the outside quite a bit to Joyner and, and uh, people that he knows can get into a crease about 12 or 16 so yards up the, the field. Outside, Allie, the corners of the That's field? That's right, corners of the field. I see. And uh, you notice his first two balls were to the sideline, and you saw what happened to those balls. They yeah. look like dying ducks yeah. coming in. That wind grabs it. Anderson was throwing things right down the middle or to the sides, that, but on an inside angle where he could throw a sharper ball. That thing has a little spiral to it. And if you throw it straight and towards the middle, you're better off on a windy day than to the outside. Those gusts can't do things to it. You know, people always said that Hell would freeze over before the Bengals made it to the Super Bowl, and it nearly did. Not even Dante could have conjured up a vision of hell like this one, unless he was given to wearing thermal underwear. This was Riverfront Stadium last week. It was not exactly a quaint picture postcard winter wonderland. Here, the Cincinnati Bengals prepared to meet the San Diego Chargers for the AFC Championship on one of the coldest Ohio afternoons in recorded history. The mercury read nine degrees below zero at game time, and harsh howling gusts dropped the wind chill factor to minus 59. But while banners were flapping, quarterback Ken Anderson quickly proved to be unflappable. On the Bengals' very first possession, Anderson marched his team 51 yards into the sharp teeth of the vicious gale. Anderson's quick darts withstood the elements, as did the receiving ability of tight end Dan Ross, number 89. 
Also helping to weather the storm was fullback Pete Johnson, number 46, who gained 20 yards on five carries during the drive. This series culminated with Jim Breach's foot-stinging field goal. Like Anderson, Breach successfully challenged the winds that screamed in his face, and his 31-yard kick provided Cincinnati with a three-to-nothing lead. The ensuing kickoff had ominous implications for San Diego. For on a day Taylor made four mistakes, James Brooks, number 21, suffered the first of four Charger turnovers. When number 51, Rick Rosano, stripped the ball away from him. Number 84, Don Bass, recovered on San Diego's 12-yard line. And two plays later, Anderson hit M.L. Harris, number 83, to send the Bengals out to a 10-0 lead. A look at Anderson on the passing end of the touchdown play shows the poise and concentration that has made him one of the most consistently accurate passers in NFL history. The MVP honors that he has already earned in 1981 are testament to a quarterback at the top of his game. But the young Bengals, some of whom were in grade school when Anderson played his first pro contest, will tell you that his value extends beyond passing skills. Anderson's calm leadership is an inspiration and in this bitterly frigid meat locker of a stadium, the Bengals needed that leadership, especially when Air Coriel began to get comfortable flying along the Arctic Circle as the first quarter drew to a close. Amidst these Ice Age conditions, the Chargers' Space Age offense took wing on the first series of the second period when Dan Fouts combined with Kellen Winslow, number 80, for a 33-yard score. Another look at the touchdown reveals that San Diego's linemen and backs pulled left to lure Cincinnati's defense away from a play designed to go against the grain. After that, it was the running ability of Winslow that put San Diego on the scoreboard. The Chargers now trail by only 10 to 7, but on the following kickoff, their joy became short-lived as rookie David Verser, number 81, traveled 40 yards with the return. From the Cincinnati 45, Anderson went to work once again, completing four of five passes for 52 yards during a seven-play, 55-yard scoring drive. On this series and throughout a day in which he was never sacked, Anderson enjoyed superb pass protection. San Diego's front four tried stunning tactics, but they were doomed to failure. A case in point is this stunt by number 90 John Woodcock, Tackle Max Montoya, number 65, stood ready and waiting to stop Woodcock. And an untouched Anderson's completion to Isaac Curtis, number 85, set up Pete Johnson's one-yard scoring punt. Fouts was not as successful as Anderson in bucking the Furies. And with his team trailing 17-7, he was forced to play catch-up. But the win played havoc with his come-from-behind efforts. Two Fouts interceptions in Bengal territory ended successive Charger drives. This theft by number 26, Bobby Kemp, killed what would be San Diego's last serious scoring threat of the entire game. And the first half concluded with the Bengals riding the whirlwinds for destiny. Allie, what about the Bengals' defense? They stopped the Chargers twice this year. How are they going to do against the 49ers? I believe they've got a real good shot, Steve. They're a mobile defense. They're a unit defense. They cover the field. They, they don't feature any one particular one or two big blockbusters. And you need that against the 49ers. You need mobility and uh, to be able to cover that quarterback that's going to move around. All right, let's get back to the second half of the AFC Championship, Ice Station Zebra. You remember that movie with Rock Hudson, Ernest Borgnine? Well, our version, actually, our version of Ice Station Zebra has an appropriate ending, because the team with the stripes emerges as the champion. 
Leading 17-7 at the start of the third quarter, the Bengals cheerfully braved the cold, while San Diego continued to find the elements too difficult to handle. The Chargers are the classically flawed team, wonderfully entertaining to watch, but also so frequently self-destructive. On this particular Sunday, it was Ken Anderson and the Bengals who made all the eye-opening plays. Number 89, Dan Ross's diving catch during Cincinnati's first possession of the second half helped set up one of the game's most unusual plays. Number 86, Steve Kreider's touchdown run was called back and the Bengals were forced to settle for a field goal. But more significantly, the play typified Cincinnati's unwillingness to let weather conditions dictate their play calling. Many felt it was the weather that negated San Diego's high-powered attack. However, Dan Fouts would certainly agree that the Bengal defense was as biting as the sub-zero temperatures. Fouts and the offense spent most of the day face down on the frozen turf, much to the delight of Cincinnati fans who exposed their loyalty to Bengal mania. While the defense held San Diego scoreless in the second half, Kenny Anderson continued to prove that 11 tough seasons and a pair of gimpy knees were not enough to make him fall short of his first Super Bowl. Anderson completed 14 passes for 161 yards with no interceptions and was the Bengals' second leading rusher behind Pete Johnson. However, it was a fourth quarter scramble that nearly put Anderson's Super Bowl hopes in the deep freeze. The stunned Bengal quarterback was forced to leave the game. And suddenly, Cincinnati's 20-7 lead seemed on very thin ice against the explosive Chargers. Number 12, Jack Thompson, the throwing Samoan, quickly warmed the hearts and cooled the nerves of Bengal fans with a big completion to Pete Johnson, number 46. play allowed Anderson time to regain his senses, and he dramatically returned to throw the game-clinching touchdown pass to number 84, Don Bass. The score, Bass's first reception of the season, was the result of both a fine catch and ineffective defense. By blitzing, linebacker Cliff Thrift, number 59, forced single coverage in his zone. And when he was unable to get to Anderson, Cincinnati capitalized on the situation. The touchdown was the game's final tally as the Bengals defeated San Diego 27-7 to win their first AFC championship in their 14-year history. The game was a true test of each athlete, and when it was over, the boys of autumn had suddenly become the men of winter. For the Chargers, the chilling disappointment of their second consecutive AFC title defeat would not simply thaw out in the locker room like their numbed fingers and toes. For Forrest Gregg, it was a game reminiscent of the years he played on the frozen fields in Green Bay, where he learned winning from Vince Lombardi, the game's greatest teacher. Gregg, in turn, has taught a young Bengal team how to win, and fittingly, in Super Bowl 16, they will play for a trophy named in honor of Coach Lombardi. Best offense, best, the best offense in the league, scored seven points against you. And I'm going to tell you something right now, man. 
<laughs> best, the best job of playing under adverse conditions I've ever seen. And I'm telling you what, I, I will, I will bar none. Super job, man. As a cold today, cold today is, has ever been a ball game played in this league. Well, you right. That's right. <laughs> I just I can't tell you how proud I am of you and what a pleasure it's been for me. For me. Okay, you got Monday. The Bengals and the 49ers will be competing for the Vince Lombardi Trophy. And this trophy and the man for whom it was named are a strange match. As you can see, this is slick polished and futuristic. Lombardi, on the other hand, was a round, rough man who believed in old-fashioned virtues. Although he died 11 years ago, the memory of Lombardi's life and death are still vivid. His funeral was held in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. He died with the courage and grace that had always marked him as a man. Lombardi. A certain magic still lingers in the very name. It speaks of duels in the snow and cold November mud. For nine years, Lombardi coached the Green Bay Packers. He drove them to five NFL championships and victories in the first two Super Bowls. His game plans contained a minimum of simple plays executed with a maximum of effort. If you look at this play, what we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here and try to run this play in the alley. What the hell's going on out here? Everybody grabbing out there. Nobody's tackling. Just grabbing, everybody. Grab, grab, grab. Nobody tackling. Put your shoulders in there out there. Beneath his stormy surface flowed the warm tide of compassion and kindness. I, I know I'm an emotional man. In order for me, for example, to give everything of myself, uh, to take the mental anguish that's all part of this game, the emotionalism that's all part of this game, in order for me to do this for someone else, I think there has to be a certain amount of love for that other person. There's love for each other, in other words, in the game of football. Lombardi believed in the old-fashioned virtues, which were stamped all over his teams. Hard work, second effort, loyalty, and love. His genius was that he was able to inspire so many of his players to grasp these ideals. Lombardi's influence extended not only to his own team, but during his short career as head coach, many hundreds of thousands of other young athletes warmed their own competitive spirits by the bright fire of this man who stood for everything that was solid and successful in American sports. He remains for many the very heart of pro football pumping hard right now. Every year, the winner of the Super Bowl is awarded the Vincent Lombardi Trophy. His legacy is the greatest prize the game can offer.
Horace Gregg, the man who took the bungle out of the Bengals as a protege of Lombardi's. And strangely enough, he is the only one to become a highly successful head coach. And one of the reasons for Gregg's success this year has been the play of his quarterback, Kenny Anderson, who was the NFL Player of the Year. Now, Allie, if you were going to play against Kenny Anderson, how would you set your defense up to stop him? Well, my defense would have to know uh, one definite thing. He's an experienced quarterback, and he stands up there at about 6'3 and a half, and he can see. And he's got a good instinct as to what to do in that pocket. Therefore, we've got to pressure him. And I would play him um, fairly tight with the receivers. He throws a, he's got a moderate passing game. He's a high percentage passer. He doesn't throw that ball way out there and go to the bombs. They play to the sticks, as we call it, and those are the yardsticks. If he needs 12 yards, he's going to throw a 14-yard ball. If he needs 8 yards, he's going to throw a 10-yard ball. And we've got to bite the bullet and tell our defenders, hug those receivers a little more. What about his running ability? Kenny Anderson is not a great runner, but he's got a maximum kind of instinct, Steve, as to when to take off, which he did in the last ball game against San Diego. Those linebackers were dropping back 15 yards, and he, he took off three straight times and said, okay, if you're going to give that to me, I'll go. And he's not a sprinter, but he made the yardage. He's got, that's, that, that's his good experience in control. Allie, you've been involved in the NFL for 35 years. What's the greatest individual performance that uh, you can remember? I've always felt that uh, Y.A. Tittle's 36 touchdown pass is a record. In 1962, is something that I would love to have had a lot of encores on. <laughs> and he did it with only 14 games in a season, and it still stands. Well, there's nothing like that this year, but there were some outstanding, and in some cases, record-breaking performances in 1981. In 1981, the spotlight's glare fell on some great performers who held center stage in a spectacular hit show of a season. Veteran place kicker Jan Stenerud of the Packers connected on 91% of his field goal attempts to establish an NFL single season accuracy record. Another special teams player who exhibited star quality was Rams return ace Leroy Irvin, number 47. In week six against Atlanta, Irvin set a league single game record for punt return yardage with 207 yards, including two touchdowns. Wide receiver Nat Moore, number 89 of Miami, produced the season's highest single game total of receiving yardage when he caught seven passes for 210 yards in a week five encounter with the Jets. Chiefs running back Joe Delaney, number 37, compile the most rushing yardage in a 1981 game. By the time this week 11 contest was through, the talented rookie had racked up 193 yards, and the Houston Oilers weren't quite sure what hit him. Another rookie who registered considerable impact was San Diego's James Brooks, number 21. The AFC's leading punt returner, Brooks also returned kickoffs, then went to work in the Chargers' backfield. His combined total of 2,093 yards in returns, rushing and receiving, made him the NFL's all-purpose yardage leader for 1981. While Brooks proved his versatility carrying the football, St. Louis's Roy Green, number 25, made his mark all over the field. Green was pro football's version of Lon Chaney, a man of a thousand faces. As a safety, he intercepted three passes. Green also played on special teams, and as a wide receiver, he averaged over 21 yards per reception. Some 1981 performances were notable, but not so great. The Oakland Raiders tied an NFL record when they suffered three consecutive shutouts. 
Too bad they didn't play the Baltimore Colts, who made league history by giving up 533 points. The Colts were like lambs off to the slaughter. And in week eight, they were well shorn by Cleveland's Brian Sight. Sight riddled the Baltimore defense for 444 passing yards, a 1981 single game high that was equaled by the Vikings' Tommy Kramer. Kramer's arm sparked to come from behind victory over San Diego in week six. The puzzling charges had a defense that gave up the most passing yards in NFL history, but their colorful offense kept clicking with the right combination for success. One reason was Chuck Muncie's league record tying 19 rushing touchdowns. While Muncie was a featured performer for the Chargers, quarterback Dan Fouts was the main attraction. Fouts established new league standards for attempts, completions, and passing yards. Fouts was a performer whose talent can be measured by numbers. But at Shea Stadium on November 22nd, Richard Todd displayed a kind of courage that doesn't appear in record books. Yet no one will ever forget this great performance. Four sacks and 38 passing attempts intensified the pain of Todd's fractured rib and sprained ankle. But he completed seven of 10 passes on a 77-yard drive in the game's final minutes. 21 seconds remaining. These fans are on their feet. Todd is back to pass. He's looking into the end zone. Oh, No wonder the NFL broke box office records in 1981. Nothing attracts and thrills a crowd like a show-stopping great performance. Here is this week's Prudential Puzzler. True or false? The Silver Dome in Pontiac, Michigan in 1982 will be the first Super Bowl site outside the Los Angeles, Miami, or New Orleans area. Here's the answer to the Prudential Puzzler. The statement that the Silver Dome will be the first Super Bowl site outside of Los Angeles, Miami, or New Orleans is false. Super Bowl VIII was played in Houston, Texas at Rice Stadium. It was the only Super Bowl that was not in the Los Angeles, Miami, or New Orleans area. Super Bowl VIII saw the Miami Dolphins repeat as NFL champions with a 24-7 victory over the Minnesota Vikings. Allie, in the NFC Championship game, how do you account for the fact that the 49ers had six turnovers and yet they still won the game, and especially against a team as good as the Dallas Cowboys. You're right. Six turnovers usually takes a ball club right out of the ball game. But I think it says one uh, a thing about each ball club. Mm -hmm. uh, the Cowboys just didn't get enough points out of those turnovers. In that given day, they weren't throwing the right kind of pass or big play that they usually get, and they, they just didn't get the points. But it also says about the 49ers that... Uh, they're ball players, and, and as a ball club, they're intact. They kept the rhythm of their offense going. They didn't, they, they didn't panic, and they just got, got in there, and they finished the ball game upside. Well, the 49ers scored first, but then they nearly buried themselves under a mountain of mistakes. Most people leave their hearts in San Francisco, but the last time Tom Landry was here, he left the city without his pride. Three months ago, his Cowboys came to the Bay Area to face the 49ers and were humiliated 45-14. to 14. The 49ers have rallied behind quarterback Joe Montana to win 13 of their last 14 games. And in the NFC title game, Montana again tried to run the Cowboys out of town. Montana spotted number 88, Freddie Salomon, for a touchdown, and the score was quickly 7 to nothing. 
In their previous meeting, the 49ers were also effective early and ran up an insurmountable lead. Dallas did not want to see a replay, so Danny White struck quickly and deep to number 80, Tony Hill. White's success came from a head fake as he lured the 49er defense with a glance to his right, then turned to throw a perfect pass to the streaking hill. Hill's touchdown, along with a field goal by Rafael Septien, pushed the Cowboys ahead 10-7. While the Cowboys offense showed it could strike with the suddenness of a blitzkrieg, the 49er attack more resembled that of a panzer division. Moving slowly and methodically, Montana marched the 49ers up the field with modest gains, usually by throwing in the middle of the field to his favorite receiver, Dwight Clark, number 87. Clark finished 1981 as the NFC's leading receiver, and in the first half alone, he caught five passes for 86 yards. Realizing the Cowboys would become wary of Clark, Montana tried to surprise them by throwing deep to another receiver. But Dallas's Everson Walls loves surprises. Walls finished the regular season with 11 interceptions, and on Sunday, he recorded two more. San Francisco held Dallas on downs, and Montana again drove the 49ers deep into Cowboy territory, this time staying with the original game plan. Montana and Clark are one of the league's most gifted passing tandems, and all year they have demonstrated a superb ability for getting the job done. Montana uses his agility instead of a powerful arm to avoid impending trouble while Clark relies on moves and soft hands rather than speed to make the big catches. The touchdown put the 49ers ahead 14 to 10, a condition Dallas saw as only temporary. For the Cowboys, this game was not only for a berth in the Super Bowl, but also for a place in history. The Cowboys were aiming for an unprecedented sixth conference title, and the Dallas offense instinctively took to the air to achieve their destiny. Number 42, Ronnie Lott's interception seemingly foiled Dallas's attempt to regain the lead, but Lott was penalized for defensive interference. Throughout the year, the 49ers' gambling secondary has reaped big dividends, but this time it failed, and running back Tony Dorsett quickly levied the fine. Dorsett's touchdown put Dallas back into the lead, and this time the Cowboy front four wanted it to stay that way. Montana encountered tremendous pressure as number 72, Ed Jones, stunted from his end position to make the 49er quarterback feel the reconditioned candlestick turf. Meanwhile, teammate Harvey Martin took a more direct route and not only took down Montana, but the ball as well. Dallas's defensive effort stopped three 49er drives and kept the score at 17 to 14. For the first half, the 49ers outgained the Cowboys two to one, but turnovers and costly penalties put San Francisco on the losing side of the ledger, a place no one wants to be when stalked by doomsday. The 49ers offense really mystifies me. Uh, they have no running attack to speak of, Ali. As a matter of fact, they rank next to last in the NFL in average gain per rush, and yet they still are very successful. Why is that? It mystifies a lot of people, Steve. But I think one of the things you have to look at is that uh, the, the statistic on running, that's a misleading one. They do enough running to make those defensive linemen dig in and honor the run. 
but they love to pass, and they do it better than anybody I've seen. They throw in first down, they use play-action pass, they've got a quarterback that can move around and has real good control when he throws the ball, and each week they may vary, they throw to the greatest number of receivers that anybody does in the league. In other words, one week it may be the tight end in the back that they go to more, another week it may be the outside receivers, and this is great pressure on defenses, and this is the kind of thing that I, I love it. It's great offense. Well, in the second half, Coach Bill Walsh had to call on all the facets of his offense to defeat the Dallas Cowboys. At no time does the proud tradition of the Dallas Cowboys surface more than in the second half of championship games. Young upstarts like the 49ers are no match for America's team with all of America watching. Well, that used to be true anyway. Bobby Leopold's interception set up the only touchdown of the third quarter, giving San Francisco a 21-17 lead. Such brash behavior by the Cavalier 49ers provoked the appropriate response from Dallas. The Cowboys went about putting the presumptuous 49ers in their place. James Jones's catch helped produce a Dallas field goal that cut the 49ers lead to 21 to 20. Moments later, following a San Francisco turnover, the Cowboys appeared to lay the 49er dreams to rest for good. Danny White found number 84, Doug Cosby, for the go-ahead touchdown. It is not too often that the Cowboys are caught from behind in the fourth quarter of playoff games. And when Joe Montana's pass was picked off by Everson Walls number 24 on the next series, it was a sure bet that Cowboy pride would prevail once again. Or at least it seemed to be certain. With four minutes, 54 seconds left in the game, San Francisco trailed 27 to 21. The 49ers had the ball on their own 11-yard line. All Joe Montana had to do was take his team 89 yards. Dallas immediately employed six defensive backs, knowing that the 49ers' only hope was their sophisticated passing game. The Cowboys were wrong. Utilizing Lenville Elliott, number 35, the 49ers ran on five of their first eight plays, foiling Dallas's prevent defense. San Francisco's resourceful strategy confused Dallas's defense. The irony of the moment was crystal clear. So many times in the past, it had been the Cowboys relentlessly driving for the winning score. This time, Dallas was trying to stay ahead, not come from behind. The Cowboys seemed strangely helpless as they watched San Francisco do to them what they had done so many times to others. With 58 seconds remaining in the 49ers on the Cowboys' six-yard line, Joe Montana and Dwight Clark ended the masterful drive in spectacular fashion. Clark's leaping grab and Ray Wershing's extra point gave San Francisco a 28-27 lead. Another look at the touchdown reveals the two primary reasons for the play's success. Montana's poise in the face of a devastating rush and Clark's tremendous athletic ability. A relative unknown among NFL receivers, Clark made a name for himself with one performance and one play. With less than a minute to go, Clark and his mates had every reason to smile. Cowboys now felt right at home. They had to come from behind in the final moments. 
When White hit number 88, Drew Pearson, for 31 yards, Dallas was in 49er territory, and 38 seconds still remained. Lawrence Pillars made certain the Cowboys got no further. Pillars, number 65, working a stunt, attacked Dallas guard Kurt Peterson, number 65, forcing Danny White to fumble. The loose ball was recovered by Jim Stuckey, number 79, and the Cowboys' comeback magic would have to wait for another day and another season. For it was the San Francisco 49ers that were going to Super Bowl 16 to face the Bengals. For the 49ers, the 28-27 victory over Dallas was quiet vindication. It was a season in which no one was quite sure just how seriously to take the 49ers. Many felt that the Cowboys would burst San Francisco's bubble. But the 49ers simply did not allow it to happen. There can be no doubt that the NFC's best team is on its way to the Super Bowl. And I'm so proud, and I don't think that anything could top this, anything in my life. And I love you all, and I thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, we talked about being champions. We talked about being champions from July 7th. We're champions right now. We got one more to go. Congratulations for a tremendous effort. Tremendous. Allie and I will be right back to pick the winner of Super Bowl 16 at the Mazda Outlook. If we look at the past history of the Super Bowl winners, there's bad news for the 49ers, Allie, because no team has ever won a Super Bowl after losing its opening game of the season, and the 49ers lost their opening game, ironically, in the Silverdome to the Lions. But forget history, I'm going to go with the 49ers to win it. Well, I'll tell you, Steve, I think this is what uh, we would call a mirror game. Both clubs are very similar in style, offensively and defensively. And uh, I do believe that uh, you'll, be, you'll think you're looking at the same ball club as they go. But both coaching staffs also are not inhibited about using some wide open play. Right. And uh, we might see some trick stuff. Mm -hmm. I truly believe you. You look at a, a wide receiver like Collinsworth and a wide receiver like Solomon. Both okay. those men have been quarterbacks at college. Uh, they, I know the play. I'll end okay. around. Pass, right? End around, receiver takes it, throws right, the right. pass, right? You've been playing out of position, so <laughs> you're in the wrong business. That's right. And with that, I'd like to make my pick, too. All right. And I go with you. It's 49ers, I believe, in this ballgame. All right. On behalf of Ali Sherman and Harry Callis and all of us at NFL Films, thanks for joining us this year on NFL Review and Preview, and we hope to see you next September.